Good afternoon and welcome to our series of webinars focused on bringing you information about COVID-19 related topics. The information in these weekly webinars is geared toward long-term care and skilled nursing facilities, but we encourage everyone who's interested to attend. My name is Kathy Caudill. I'm a communications specialist with Quality Insights. Today we'll be discussing updated COVID-19 guidance that relates to nursing homes. Today's discussion will be a rebroadcast of our October 19th presentation by Quality Insights Infection Preventionist Jennifer Brown. Excuse me. Following the presentation, we'll have a live Q&A with Jennifer and our healthcare experts. Everyone has entered the meeting on mute, but if you have questions or comments for our discussion, please submit them using either the chat or the Q&A tool in your Zoom menu. We encourage you to join us every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for more webinars in this series Next week, we will be discussing reducing 30-day readmissions and avoidable emergency department trips. And now I'm going to start playing our recording of the presentation from October 19th. When it's done, I will stop the video and we'll have our live Q&A. Jennifer Brown is here and uh, Penny Imes is here to uh, answer any of your questions. And please put in the chat if you are having a uh, any issues with, with the audio, and we'll try to see if we can fix them. And now I would like to introduce our guest today, Jennifer Brown. Jennifer is a quality improvement and infection preventionist at Quality Insights. She is a registered nurse with over 10 years of experience in a variety of healthcare settings, most recently as Director of Staff Development and Infection Prevention in Long-Term Care. She has also led several quality improvement and infection control initiatives in acute and ambulatory settings. So Jennifer, welcome back and uh, thank you for joining us today. And you, have your, and you have your presentation up there on the screen. So when you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Brown um, and Today, we will go over some uh, updated guidance from the CDC and also from uh, CMS regarding COVID-19 updates. So there have been some updated guidance um, surrounding um, source control for visitors and staff, vaccination status, uh, which is no longer used to determine source control, screening, testing, or post-exposure recommendations. Um, also, routine testing of asymptomatic staff is no longer recommended. Quarantine and work restrictions for exposures are generally no longer recommended. And there's been updated testing recommendations for asymptomatic patients and residents um, and healthcare personnel. Also, updated testing testing recommendations for those who have recovered from COVID-19. So there are some guidance that will stay the same. Uh, the time frame for isolation for both residents and healthcare personnel will continue to be the same. Um, symptomatic individuals will still need to be tested and also the use of PPE for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 is still recommended. The Pennsylvania Health Alert Network uh, guidance has also been updated to reflect these changes. So the PAHON 621 has been replaced with PAHON 661, which covers work restrictions for healthcare personnel with exposure to COVID-19. Uh, PAHON 622 has been replaced with PAHON 662 which covers return to work for our healthcare personnel with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. And PA Hans 624, 626, and 627 have been replaced with PA Hans 663, which covers infection prevention and control recommendations for healthcare settings during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no longer a separate Han for nursing home recommendations, Nursing home recommendations have been added to the HAN for healthcare setting, and there's a section addressing nursing home under that. Um, um. So the first major change that we'll discuss today is regarding source control and universal PPE. 
Source control recommendations are based on community transmission, not community levels. Um, vaccination status no longer used to determine if source control is to be used. And in areas where community transmission is high, everyone in the facility uh, should wear source control, such as face masks or a respirator and to cover their mouth and nose. In areas where community transmission is not high, healthcare providers should choose, can choose not to wear source control in non-resident care areas unless there's an outbreak, in which case um, source control is required. Source control is still recommended for individuals who have suspected or confirmed COVID-19 infection, or if they have had an exposure to someone with COVID-19. Facilities located in counties with community transmission, with high community transmission, should also consider having healthcare providers use universal PPE for all gener aerosol generating procedures, all uh, surgical surgical procedures that might pose a higher risk for transmission if the patient has uh, a COVID infection and in specific units or area of the facility at higher risk for COVID transmission. Universal PPE includes N95 respirator and eye protection, such as goggles or face shield that covers the sides of the face and the front of the face, uh, which should be worn during all patient care encounters. The next change, the major change in guidance uh, surrounds screening testing, which is no longer recommended for nursing home uh, healthcare personnel if they are asymptomatic and not had a recognized exposure. There have been some changes in recommendation for exposures to COVID-19 um, and under the new guidance, asymptomatic healthcare personnel do not require work restriction after a higher risk exposure, regardless of their vaccination status. For the CDC, a high risk exposure is any prolonged close contact with a resident, visitor, or another healthcare provider with a confirmed COVID infection where the healthcare provider was not using a respirator, was not wearing eye protection, or was not wearing all recommended PPE while in the room for aerosol generating procedure. Asymptomatic individuals, regardless of their vaccination status, should be tested following exposure. Um, the first test should take place on day one after exposure. So this test should take place immediately, but not less than 24 hours from that exposure. The exposure date is considered day zero. If the test is negative on day one, they should test again in 48 hours, which would be day three post exposure. And a, if the second test is negative, then they should test again in 48 hours, which would be day five post exposure. Testing is not recommended for asymptomatic individuals who have recovered in the past 30 days, which it was previously recommended as 90, but it's been shortened to 30. Um, if the individual develops any symptoms at any point, even within that 30 days post-infection, they should be tested. Um, an antigen test is recommended for individuals who have recovered from COVID-19 in the past 90 days. Quarantine is no longer routinely recommended if the individual is asymptomatic, regardless of their vaccination status. Any individual who has had an exposure should monitor symptoms. They should be tested on days one, three, and five, and use source control for the 10 days following their exposure. In the event your facility receives a new admission, uh, new testing recommendations will apply. So if the county transmission is high, 
test new admissions with the series of three tests. First being on admission, then again on day three and day five, and residents should be advised to wear source control for 10 days. If the community transmission is not high, new admissions should be tested at the discretion of their facility per CDC guidance. They should be advised to wear source control for their 10 days after admission as well. Any residents who have been out of the facility for longer than 24 hours should be managed as a new admission. The quarantine and testing is not recommended for residents that they have less, left the facility for less than 24 hours for doctor's appointments, outings, etc. Empiric use of transmission-based precautions may, uh, following a close contact with COVID-19 may be considered if the resident is unable to be tested or wear source control as recommended for the 10 days following their exposure. The resident is moderately or severely immunocompromised or if the resident or is residing on a unit with others who are moderately or severely immunocompromised, or if the resident is residing on a unit experiencing ongoing COVID transmission that is not controlled with initial intervention. If testing does identify a new or confirmed case of COVID-19 in residents or staff, it is recommended to use contact tracing to identify any potentially exposed contacts. Uh, those individuals should be tested with three viral tests and um, they should maintain source control for any exposed individuals. If all potential contacts are unable to be identified or managed with contact tracing, or if the contract case tracing fails to halt transmission, then a broad-based approach should be used. With the broad-based approach, all residents and staff may be tested um, in the affected area, such as you know, a group level, such as a unit, floor, building, or it could be facility-wide. In the event that you find evidence of ongoing transit, transmission, the facility should consider implementing quarantine and work restrictions, um, switch from that contract contact tracing to the broad based approach, and also continue testing residents and staff every three to seven days until no new cases are identified for 14 days. Uh, return to work criteria for healthcare professionals with confirmed COVID-19. Um, healthcare professionals with mild to moderate infection who are not moderately to severely immunocompromised can return to work if at least seven days have passed since their symptoms started and the healthcare professional uh, has a negative antigen tests within 48 hours of returning to work. They can return to work after 10 days if they are not being tested. Uh, the, if the um, healthcare professional um, has severe or critical COVID-19 illness, they can return to work if at least 10 days have passed and up to 20 days uh, since their symptoms appeared and they have been fever free for at least 24 hours uh, without the use of any fever reducing medications. And then if there's symptoms such as cough or shortness of breath that improve. Healthcare personnel who have or, or um, moderately to severely immunocompromised um, should use a test day strategy and consult with infectious disease and their occupational health professional to determine when it is best for them to return to work. Uh, there are some updated visitation recommendations. Um, 
that state that facilities should provide guidance, such as posted signs at entrances or visitors who have confirmed COVID-19 symptoms of COVID-19 or have had a high-risk exposure to someone with confirmed COVID-19 to defer any non-urgent in-person visitation until they meet criteria um, for to end their isolation. Also, for visitors who have had close contact with someone with COVID-19, it is safest to defer, to defer non-urgent uh, in-person visitation until 10 days after their close contact if they meet criteria described in CDC healthcare guidance. Also, in areas where community transmission is high, everyone should wear masks within the facility. Um, in areas where the transmission rate is not high, uh, facilities can choose to not require visitors to wear masks unless there is an outbreak. And with all these recommendations, your policies should reflect that. Do you have any questions? All right, so welcome back. And if Jennifer is ready to, let's turn our cameras back on, if I can. Here we go. All right, I'm back and Jennifer's here. Um, if you're ready, please start submitting any questions that you might have for our live Q&A session. If you can, you can put them either in the chat for the Q&A box, or if you would like, you can also raise your hand if you would like to be able to unmute yourself and ask your question audibly. And while we're waiting, I will take a minute to run over uh, some notes for next week's presentation, some of our other offerings while we wait on anyone who has questions. Um, again, I'd like to remind everyone that next week's webinar will be at 2 p.m. Wednesday and we'll be discussing reducing 30-day readmissions and avoidable emergency department trips. And in addition to our webinars, we hold office hours twice a week. Those are like live chat rooms where you stop by and someone from our team will be there to answer your questions or comments. So if you're interested in attending our office hours, those are Tuesdays at 8 a.m. and Thursdays at 2 p.m., except for this Thursday due to the holiday. And you can find the links to our office hours and webinars in the newsletter that we send out each Friday called the Last Minute Lowdown. If you would like to receive that newsletter but don't think you're on the mailing list, you can email me at ccaudill at qualityinsights.com and I'll get you on the list. And I will also put my email in the chat shortly. All right, are there any questions? I don't see anything so far. It looks like, oh, here we go. We do have a Q&A question. It says, do we still use the chart that has the conventional contingency and crisis capacity criteria when determining HCW return to work dates post COVID, post positive COVID? And Jen, if you'd like to read that, that's in the Q&A, if you'd like to read the question yourself. And your mute is still on, by the way. <laughs> so sorry about that. So the uh, contingency, um, conventional crisis status um, has been taken out of that section. However, you know, you can still, um, you know, put that into your company policy, you know, but that has been, that uh, part of the um, guidance has been removed. All right, that's all the questions we have so far. And I'm putting our emails in the chat real quick. In case anyone needs that on hand. All right, so that question is answered. Again, if anyone wants to raise their hand to ask their question out loud, you can do it that way. And I'll keep an eye on your um, the panel to see if anyone's raised their hands. All right, we'll give people a minute to ask their oh, questions if they have. Just unmuted my old video. <laughs> a little surprising to hear my own voice coming across. Okay. Well, let's see about, oh, here we go. We have another question. It says, are you going to talk about the new TNA regulations? So that was something that we had for last week's webinar. 
I can um, put the link to that video recording in the chat for everyone to be able to click on that and watch that afterwards. So that was with um, Deborah Wright last week. I'll give everyone another minute while I pull up that video. If you have questions, go ahead and uh, submit that. And Kathy, this is Penny. I just want to remind everybody, if you are not getting our weekly last minute lowdown newsletter, please make sure that you reach out to Kathy or to your quality improvement specialist. And we'll make sure that you're on that list because it includes all of the webinars that we are having each week, what we had last week, links to the recordings, and a lot of nice resources that we developed every month. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So please, please use that newsletter um, resource. It's a great one. And if you're on YouTube, you could also follow our YouTube channel and um, you will be able to see if you're a subscriber when you log on to YouTube on your dashboard whenever we put up a new video. So um, we have these webinars every Wednesday and I usually get the video up either Thursday or Friday. And then I also will email it out to people who registered for the webinar. So I put in the chat the video for the TNAs. Um, and again, if you are having a hard time finding that, if you can't see the chat for some reason, um, we put the videos also on our website, qualityinsights.org slash QIN. And if you go to the multimedia tab, I put all the videos there too. We try to put in a few different places. All right, so that's it for questions. How much longer do you think we should um, wait around for questions? Do you think we should go ahead and wrap up, Penny? Yeah, I think we should wrap up. We'd like to wish everybody yeah. a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for giving your time today, giving us your time today. And um, we hope everyone gets to enjoy a nice Thanksgiving. Yeah, really thankful that you all were able to join us today. Um, and again, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email me, Jennifer Brown, Penny will get you in touch with whoever can help you. Uh, again, my email is ccaudill at qualityinsights.com. Jennifer Brown's is jbrown at qualityinsights.com. And Penny's is pimes at qualityinsights.org, P-I-M-E-S. And I think we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I hope everybody has a happy Thanksgiving. Jen, thanks for coming back and Penny and uh, the Quality Insights team. We'd like to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and hope to see you back again soon. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Bye-bye.